Thank you so much for being here with us today, Rebecca. I'm so excited about the initiative you guys have going on. So if you just want to give a little bit about the program, how it started and how it's helping people get um, processing facilities going. Yeah, so NPAN, which stands for Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, is an extension program that's housed at Oregon State University. We were founded about 12 years ago by a couple of PhD students who were working um, on uh, building niche meat supply chains as part of their uh, dissertations and realized there wasn't a lot of resources in extension for meat processors. There was a lot for producers, um, but not a lot of information and knowledge sharing for the processing sector. Um, so they created this national community of practice, which is made up of practitioners in the field, boots on the ground. So it's made up of meat producers, processors, distributors, retailers, as well as uh, like academics, like meat scientists. And then we also have folks from regulatory agencies that are part of our network that chime in and answer questions. Um, so our core work is uh, developing educational content for meat processors. We survey them every year at the beginning of the year and ask them what they wanna learn about and what kind of resources they want. And then we spend the rest of the year developing that content and providing it for them uh, free of charge. So that's what we do. That's that's pretty awesome. Clearly every year there's new problems, right? That's really a great way yeah. to kind of handle the, the issues as they arise, especially yeah. I'm sure since it's moving a lot faster all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So what is your advice for someone who wants to get started in the meat processing facility? Basically, they're hitting bottlenecks in their current situation. They're like, I think it would be a good idea. Just what's kind of your basic framework to get started for the average farmer or person who wants to help get this started? Yeah, I mean, just like you would to start any business, um, I suggest starting off first with a feasibility study. That's really looking at the technical and financial a feasibility of, a, of, a, of an idea, of a business idea, as well as analyzing the market. Um, and if that feasibility study shows sort of green light, like go forward, it's either going to show you red, yellow, or green, right? Red being bad idea, yellow being like maybe, and then uh, green being like great opportunity, go forth. Um, then you develop a business plan. Um, and from there, uh, if things still look good, then you would go put together your financing, going to lenders, grants, et cetera, taking your own personal financing. Um, but most folks don't make it past that stage um, because generally the feasibility study just says that, no, it's not a good idea. Um, so our website is chock full of feasibility study archives where you can see uh, kind of what they look like. We also have a business planning guide and a template. We have a lot of budgeting tools. Uh, some of them are out of date, but they show you, they're not going to show you exact uh, costs of things today. Just uh, take, take all of the costs and probably multiply it by 10 for today's um, right. cost. But it'll, it'll show you how to organize um, a startup budget as well as an operating budget. So those are two separate things. Um, and then we have a bunch of other planning guides uh, recorded webinars and such on our website. So lots of research. Um, and if, you know, folks need assistance throughout any of that process, they're welcome to reach out to me. And then I also have a team of consultants that I've just hired to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, technical assistance. Um, but in general, um, my rule of thumb today with current costs of construction are that you need at least 2,000 head of beef or beef equivalent annually. And when I say beef equivalent, that would be two pigs or four sheep or goats per beef, right? You need at least that many animals um, over the course of the year to justify building an inspected meat processing facility. Um, and you know, minimum size being about 5,000 square feet. Minimum cost these days uh, is about $450 a square foot. So we're looking at about two and a half million dollars um, just to get started. That doesn't include real estate. Uh, that doesn't include uh, the waste system, parking, none of that. That's just the building. That doesn't include equipment either. Um, so probably closer to three to four million dollars just to open up the doors. And you need to have that 
that number of animals assured when you open up on day one or you will quickly go out of business. So in general, uh, most of the farmers that call me looking for processing or thinking about starting processing are not even close to hitting those numbers yet. Um, so there's still a ways off from having the numbers in which to justify opening their own facility. Aside from those numbers, are there any like just big qualifiers where you're like, this is just a definite no, like if your community is this small or, you know, things that just from being in it, you know, that these are really not viable or things that these really are any just like large scale parameters that you find really just knock people out of the game before they get started? Well, apart from the volume of animals that you uh, need to move, you have to have a market already developed. Um, and so farmers who are either new to direct marketing um, or say they're, they've been cow-calf producers their whole life and have never actually finished animals and then gone out and marketed those animals, uh, they're not ready yet. And I would suggest they start by working with processors that are already in business. Um, you may have to drive a few hours to get processing slots these days, but they are starting to open up. Um, and just work on building your brand and building your market um, and solidify that. I always say kind of start with the market and then work backwards. So once you've built a, you know, a repertoire of market channels, solid, solid partners and buyers, uh, you work with co-packers to get your animals processed and then you scale hopefully over time, then once you hit those like 2000 head, head numbers, that's when you can start thinking about, okay, maybe it's time to vertically integrate and take over um, my own processing. There's a couple ways around that. Um, that's not the only way to do it. If you don't wanna slaughter, you could always uh, have your animals slaughtered under inspection, either state or federal inspection and then take those carcasses and do what's called retail exempt butchery with them. And that is for, I know quite a few farmers who like to do their own butchery, who are good at it, who enjoy that aspect of it. And in that case, you can build a commercial kitchen or rent a commercial kitchen and do your own butchery. Um, it cuts as well as some process, further processing, like grinding and, and making sausage and stuff. And that does not require USC inspection for that side of things. It just requires that the carcass is killed under, or the animals killed under inspection. And the facility that you're using is a commercial kitchen. So um, that's a much cheaper and lower risk way for people to start dabbling um, in kind of taking over their processing and also uh, a great way to uphold the quality of the meat that you've processed. If, if quality concerns are one of the reasons why you want to do your own processing, and I know that that is an issue, that would be one way to take over that aspect of processing without spending millions of dollars. I, I like your cheaper versions of getting things done. It's always the middleman, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, something else that comes up a lot when we have these discussions is, of course, like mobile slaughter units and the options that those offer. Do you just kind of high level overview where do those kind of fit in with what farmers can do with those right now? Yeah, so for red meat, um, you could uh, you can either, you could pay a custom mobile kill truck to kill your animals. And that is, uh, that's considered custom exempt. So that meat is not for sale. That's when someone pre-buys your animal, right? Or buys a, a quarter of your animal. So that is already available in most parts of the country. There's these, they're generally men that you call up. They bring their kill trucks onto your farm and will kill your animals for you. Um, and you could start a business doing that. It's not very lucrative and it's very backbreaking and the kill trucks generally way undercharge for their services. So you're competing against a bunch of guys who um, aren't paying themselves very well, right? Um, so that's, that's an option that's already available. Um, if you wanna do mobile uh, slaughter under inspection, you're gonna have to purchase a truck um, that is pulled by a semi semi-truck so it's a trailer pulled by semi-truck because all of the evisceration and skinning has to take place inside that's why it's a much larger truck and the minimum cost for one of those is about three hundred thousand. 
and they generally range about half a million. Um, most manufacturers charge about that much. You have to have a commercial truck driver to drive that thing, separate person, right? Very, very expensive these days. Uh, your, your insurance is going to be incredibly expensive. Your fuel is going to be incredibly expensive. And there's almost no way to pencil uh, those outfits. I have never seen one that, um, that made a profit. Okay. So you're so, basically in those two camps that it just can't reach that economy of scale when it's mobile and too many requirements. And yeah. Like that. It's not working when it's mobile. Some people yeah. have parked it permanently and the farmers bring their animals to them. Yeah. And that is a cheaper way to get into slaughter um, than building a building. Um, however, if they're not cut and wrap. You're only doing slaughter. There's no money made on the slaughter side. All the all the actual profit margins generally made on the processing and the value added products, right? So just doing slaughter as a service is not really financially viable. And then poultry is kind of a different um, ball game. You can process under the federal poultry exemptions, which allow you to kill up to twenty thousand birds on farm. And there are a few outfits that run around processing poultry. And I've never heard of any of them um, making a profit. Um, and I think there might be like one or two USCA mobile processing trailers and they don't make a profit either. So um, if someone figures out how to make them profitable, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say profitability is definitely the question. Of the My job here at Extension is to <laughs> gather data, yeah. analyze it and present it. And so I'm always looking for models um, and if someone can show me some financials that show show it being profitable, I would love to hear about it. But most of the mobile units that we have listed on our website are no longer in operation because of the lack of profitability. Where they do seem to make sense is in island communities like Martha's Vineyard, the Alaskan Islands, the San Juan Islands of Washington, because the cost of ferrying live animals to the mainland is, is cost prohibitive. Therefore, they can charge a lot for the slaughter and, and be competitive, right? right? So it's unfortunately, it's just, it's not a panacea um, and it doesn't work in most locations. Well, that's good to know though, right? Because that's the biggest thing is how can we cut costs in it? And if it just can't yeah. reach the economies of scale, let's just not <laughs> head down the road unless that's viable. Um, yeah. Can you elaborate a little more, of course, about the USDA cut versus slaughter in the backyard? Slaughter in the backyard, <laughs> for lack of better words, you know, is something that people are leaning towards doing and selling the quarters and the holes. Do you find that that is kind of a route that's expanding because of the lack of USDA facilities or what's going on in that area right now? Um, I mean, I know all the mobile kill trucks out there are busier than ever, um, killing people's sort of backyard and homestead animals. I think for small process or small producers, it's a great way to go. Like if you have less than 20 head, um, it's, it's actually, you make the most profit by selling, you know, quarters, halves and holes because you have no very minimal marketing expenses. You're not paying for the cost of processing. You're not storing meat. None of that. It's very, it's very simple, right? It's not that hard to find friends and family that are willing to buy quarters and halves. Right. Um, so that's that, you know, nobody's collecting data on that. So I don't know if it's expanded, but I do know from the kill truck operators that I talk to, they can't keep up with demand. So um, yeah, so that, that is a good way to go. People just need to understand the law that they're selling a live animal and they're not selling meat. And they need to make that very clear to their customers that they're buying that live animal and they're paying for the cost of processing and they have to go pick up their own meat. So, you know, I think most consumers are just not used to that. So I don't think it's going to have like some, some giant resurgence of people buying locker meat because the majority of American consumers don't have freezers, don't really understand how to call up a butcher and tell them how to cut their animal, you know. Um, but it's a great way to go uh, to save money and fill your freezer with meat from a consumer standpoint, for sure. I think that's where we're all the backyard farmer to where you're becoming a producer. Like we have to make those calls and who your consumer is, right? So it kind of depends who you're marketing to and what they want to mm -hmm. of course. <laughs> yeah. 
So what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people make when getting started? Like, and this can even be like personality based, like there's just some people who aren't a fit for it. Um, anything you've seen that comes up that just like, if you have these druthers, this would probably not be a place you're going to succeed any kind of deal breakers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, a few things. One, I think a lot of folks think because they're skilled farmers, they'll be skilled processors. They're totally different businesses. Um, there's also only so many hours in the day. So if your farming business already is a full-time job, processing is going to be more than a full-time job. Uh, that's going to burn you out really quickly, right? And something's going to give you're either going to slack on your farming or you're going to slack on the processing and you can't slack on the processing. Um, you know, you food safety regulations are incredibly stringent in this country. So you, that's, that's the side of things you can't slack on. Um, so that part could be unsustainable. Also, I think, um, a lot of people get into processing because they want to get their animals processed, but they're not necessarily a people person. And you can't run a processing facility without being a people person um, because your staff um, make your business operate or not. So you have to provide good leadership and you have to have good people skills. And sometimes that's not always a good fit for folks. Um, this is not a one person operation <laughs> processing facility unless you are just running a mobile kill truck, doing it all yourself. Um, and then the moment you want to scale and reach profitability is completely dependent on your leadership skills and your people skills. So if that's not your, your forte and your strength, um, that's probably not the industry to go into. Um, also, if you hate paperwork, not the right industry for you. <laughs> this is, it's just an incredible, I mean, incredible amount of paperwork I've seen. I've seen some of my favorite processors, like stacks of paperwork, you know, that just go to the ceiling. Um, it's not, you know, if your love is like the butchery, the artisan butchery, the making the sausages and the salamis and the pâtés and the kofi and all the fun, interesting things, it's not the industry for you to go into either. Um, because you as the owner operator will not get to do any of the fun stuff. Um, you're you're gonna be the one hiring and firing, filling out regulatory paperwork, dealing with the inspectors, um, cleaning out the waste barrels, <laughs> you know, fixing equipment, <laughs> all that. So uh, you may wanna just go get a job as a butcher in a nice butcher shop or something, if that's what you like to do. Um, and then, Another thing I've seen is that um, I've seen pro I've seen people open up processing facilities without even writing a business plan, and I'm like, "What? Well, how did you get financing?" And they're like, "Well, I've had a longstanding relationship with my bank; they've wow. been my my lender <laughs> for decades for the farm, and you know they know they, they know I'm good on it, so they just lent me five million dollars for a processing plant, and I'm like." without a business plan. And they're like, yeah, they trusted me. I'm like, well, you should write a business plan now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> that just makes me After nervous the for them, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think you always got to start off with a good business plan. And then I, I, th I think my last point is that um, just because there's a lot of animals in an area does not mean um, you're going to have a lot of animals brought to your facility. So for example, there's plenty of states out in the West where there's more cattle than people, right? Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, like more cattle and sheep than people, right? That does not mean that there's farmers who are finishing animals, have developed markets and are going to bring you animals to be slaughtered, right? If the farmers don't have established businesses and established markets, there are no animals for you to process. Cow-calf producers do not finish animals. Lamb producers do not finish and sell finished um, lamb, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you really need to talk to the people who have built markets and established brands and find out if they're willing to bring you animals to be slaughtered. They may have great relationships with their processors already, 
and not want to change that situation. And so you, you can't start with those kind of assumptions. You really have to do like a deep market analysis where you go talk to people and survey them and all of that. So that's, that's my, um, my quick hits of, of top tips. <laughs> those are pretty good ones though, because you make those assumptions. Well, there's cows everywhere. We must process them. Yeah. We don't realize they're hauling them out to, you know, the other side of the country. Yeah. So I think those are some very yeah. good, valid ones. Um, yeah. The paperwork did bring up the question. Do you kind of need any background training? Like, let's say we're not all business people, right? Like, so what kind of skill set would you say would be the minimum for somebody who wanted to go into that as far as like paperwork and understanding of regulatory issues? Is that something you just got to jump in and learn it or anything you would say just to kind of already be there? Well, you need to have taken a HACCP course, which is your, your food safety course, and that's to write your food safety plan for your facility. Um, as far as regulations go, uh, you know, in order to get your grant of inspection from USDA, you will have read all of the regulations. You will have built your facility to comply with those regulations. So and that and it takes about two years to construct anything. By the time that happens, you probably will be close to an expert by that point, right? right. Um, you know, you just have to be a voracious uh, reader. You know, you have to uh, be open-minded and open to learning um, and to know what you don't know and be willing to seek it out or find the right people, you know? And then, um, you know, have some leadership skills and people skills, which I, you know, some of that you can learn through business books and stuff like that, but a lot of it is just um, trial and error, you know, and being open to learning. Um, there, there are a lot of good processors I know that are using what's called uh, open book management. Um, and that's where they actually uh, open up all of their financials to their staff and train them in how to interpret it. And then that gets staff buy-in. And so the whole staff uh, acts like a team because they're all working for the betterment of this company and they know all the financials. Like if the company does well, they get they they do well. You know, they do profit sharing and stuff like that. And so I think the more transparent you can be as an owner with your staff, um, the happier they'll be. And really the, the linchpin right now is attracting and retaining staff. That's pretty much the the key challenge for meat processors in this country. Um, so the people skills are incredibly important. I was about to say, I didn't even think about the, the labor force of the people who are, you know, going yeah. in and out. So I guess that, uh, that'll lead me to one more segue um, is, yeah. you know, I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing some farmers come in and do a processing facility together. So it's like five farmer owned. Are you mm -hmm. finding that because it's collaborative, some of those are doing better or are you finding any you know synchronicity and something like that yeah i have seen a number of them um get started and i think there, there's a couple advantages to it one is is pulling capital so uh you know the the money that you put in um you could start off with a larger sum if you're pulling from several producers you don't have to take out as much debt you know and paying that monthly debt can really eat into your profit. So that's a benefit. And then assuring that volume of animals. So if you bring together five producers and say you're trying to hit that 2000 head a year mark and you can pull together a thousand animals a year from your five owners. So you have an LLC with five owners, that's 50% of your volume that you need to open up that facility. Now you just need to go out and find the other thousand. So that certainly helps like assure that steady throughput that you need to be successful. Whether or not they're more successful, I don't know. I haven't seen any data on that. It'd be a great research project that I don't have time for. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But yeah, and it's, it's same similarly with cooperatives. Um, it doesn't have to be a cooperative, you know, it can be an LLC. Um, but I think the the pooling of funds and the pooling of animals can can be helpful. That makes sense to me. Like at least knock out the margins that you have to hit and get a couple of people on board before you go wide. Mm -hmm. so. um, mm -hmm. But you have to get along. And now right, of got, course. <laughs> we we won't have four other people to answer to. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Um, and my last question for you, are there any kind of industry trends or things you see emerging, the conversation of decentralizing the food system and all those different, you know, food questions are coming up post COVID more or less. Um, are you seeing any changes or trends that are new to this or is it still USDA processing is kind of the standard and everything that's going on? Well, there, there are more states adding state inspection, but that's not going to change anything because it's the same set of regulations as federal. Um, there's not going to be any watering down of regulations. Uh, that, that is never going to happen. Um, you know, there are, there's, there's legislation submitted to allow states to be able to regulate meat however they want, but that is, that's a pipe dream that's never going to happen. So uh, more states adding state inspection, more states joining the cooperative interstate shipment program, which will allow state inspected meat to cross state lines. So I think we'll see more of that. Um, I mean, obviously a billion dollars of investment by Biden uh, is gonna make a dent and there's gonna be a lot more small and mid-scale plants uh, opened, new ones, as well as expansions of existing operations. So I think we'll see a lot more slaughter slots obviously open up in the next couple of years. Um, but I also think we're gonna see a lot of plants for sale in the next couple of years uh, because there's gonna be saturation in a lot of areas. Um, there's also quite a few mid-scale plants being proposed right now or under construction, uh, which will take away a tiny bit of market share from the big four. Um, we'll, see, we'll see how they do. They need market access. So if they don't develop partnerships with retailers, I don't know where they're going to sell that meat. Um, and then, you know, there's been an explosion in e-commerce and uh, a lot of farmers are wanting to jump into that boat. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's also incredible competition. And because of the pandemic, shipping times have increased a lot. So being able to sell frozen meat across the country is a little dicey right now, um, because instead of two days, it's taking four days and um, your meat might be thawed out by then. So we'll see how that market pans out. But I, you know, I think savvy farmers with good market marketing abilities, especially if they come together as regional brands, because individual farmers trying to compete against each other is pretty hard, but you're seeing a lot more collaboration and cooperation. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of balls in the air. It, it's exciting times. Um, and we'll see who has the staying power to get through this. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're kind of seeing the same thing. It's getting a little crazy. <laughs> We're going to see ebb and flow. And it's of course yeah. down to like a good business plan, right? Like, have you done yeah. your marketing share? Are you running a business well? So I think that's just at the end of the day, that's kind of the measure you have to go against, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Not just, not just we need processing now. Everybody go open yeah. a place, you know, <laughs> we're not. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> processors only are a function of the market, right? You, you don't have processing if you don't have the market. And so if farmers are concerned about um, uh, getting their animals to market, they should, in my opinion, focus mainly on the market. Processing will work itself out. And you know, if you've got to drive a few hours to find a good processor and, and develop a consistent relationship, I think it's worth it because uh, that relationship is is critical. And I don't think we're never going to see a processor in every county uh, or within an hour of every farmer. And that would be ridiculous because, as I said, you need so many animals to sustain every processor. And so you want one about out here in the West, I say one every three hours, right? That's about the radius that they can sustain in more densely populated places where there's farmers everywhere, like North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, you could have one every hour, right? Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see how it shakes out. Like it's about to be the opportunity of things and hopefully in a good way, right? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Is there any other things you wanna add just to the perspective person? I mean, there's been a lot of great advice. Anything else you can think of? <laughs> well, there's two short courses I'd love to tell people about. So we developed a course a couple of years ago called the Western Meat School. Um, and the only thing that's Western about it is um, one of our classes on pasture management is focused more on dryland um, pastures, right? But everything else applies to anywhere 
you may farm or ranch, uh, but that is focused on helping producers learn how to direct market meat. So everything from finishing the animal well to all the way through selling it. Uh, and that's available on demand now as a course, just westernmeatschool.com. And we just finished up yesterday our Meat Processor Academy, which is another short course geared towards uh, small and mid-scale meat processors, uh, not necessarily startups, although we did have a few take it. Um, and that course is going to be available on demand in about in about a month um, once I once I edit all the videos, um, and that is also a six week course about was it about twenty four hours of content, and uh, it'll be a great opportunity for folks to learn about what it takes to run a successful meat processing facility. That's awesome. I was about to say, we're going to link all the awesome resources you have on your site. You have so much to yeah. go through. So between, you know, all your great advice and all that, I think people are really getting a hand pulled in that wasn't there previously. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.